Okay, we have our next presenters ready to go and on board. So let me introduce our next session. Um, and you all can, yes, un unmute and turn on your cameras. Okay, so first we have Dr. Jeanette Strasberger as a pediatric electrophysiologist from Children's uh, Hospital, Wisconsin. And her uh, nurse coordinator, Gretchen Eckstein, will they'll discuss some treatments benefiting the human fetus with FMCG. And we'll also hear from one of her patients and now a mom, Susie, Susie Burnt, Burnt, yes, and share some of her perspective. So welcome all of you. Thank you for being here. And so Jeanette, are you gonna get started? I am, and a thank you to Marsha, Aaron, and Alice, and everyone at SADS. It's such a pleasure to always um, be part of this. I learn from every conference that you have, and I would encourage everybody who didn't get to attend all of them to, to look online for a lot of the recorded sessions that they have. I know Susie's spoken in the past and, and, and um, other people as well. So Anyway, take advantage of SADS in every way you can. So I'm going to be sharing my screen here. I hope you can see this. Hang on just a second. It may take me a second here. Um, let me put it in a display mode. See if it'll go into display mode. That's the wrong one. Okay, now can people see there this? You go. Yes, that's good. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to be talking today about pregnancy and fetal MCG, which is a, a tool that may not be familiar to everyone. It's uh, similar to electrocardiography, so it's a safe uh, technology. I do have a few uh, disclosures. We'd like to thank the NIH and also the Dr. Scholl Foundation, who now and in the past have supported um, our work and have helped us with uh, patients from around the country who want to come and have this, te uh, this test done. As it is right now, we're expanding to um, other areas um, in, the, in the community for FMCG. Um, but we think that the future is still a couple years in advance before we are able to have everybody have FMCG in their own community. So in the meantime, at present time, at least, we do have funding sufficient to provide uh, the test at free cost. And also for patients who want to come, we um, do pay them for their participation. And we also help them with the cost of airline tickets for themselves and the partner who comes with them. Um, I didn't mention uh, yet that um, one of the technologies um, called optically pump magnetometry is not yet FDA approved. Um, it hopefully will be within a couple of years, but I'll show some examples of the tests that we've performed and talk about it a little bit. We're actually very excited because we were just invited to speak at a a Zoom conference with a subcommittee at the FDA called the Quantum Subcommittee. And we were told that they think that this may be one of the most important advances in quantum science that have come about. And that could be really exciting for us. Um, so we hope you can um, learn from us. Um, first of all, when the heart um, activates with each heartbeat, it starts at the top and moves toward the bottom. And with each electrical beat of the heart, there's also a magnetic signal that surrounds the electric signal. Um, so that also passes um, in the direction, as you can see with the thumb here. So it's a little different direction, but really the signals look exactly the same. And um, in Wisconsin, we at the Herma Heart Institute have been lucky to work with the medical physicists in Madison to bring forward technologies that support the community in general um, with um, long QT syndrome. Most of our work has been with long QT syndrome as opposed to Brigada syndrome or CPVT. We have seen some CPVT patients, but um, you have to have something on the electrocardiogram that we can look for, um, or you have to have an arrhythmia in the fetus for us to be able to help. So not every patient needs to have this technology done, but it's certainly beneficial for patients with long QT syndrome, both for finding out if the baby has risk factors for arrhythmias before they're born and also to know if your baby does or doesn't have long QT because that can have influences as to where you deliver your baby, who delivers your baby. So, so I think this can be helpful to um, participate. As it is right now, we do it under a protocol 
and that allows us to cover the cost. And, and I think if you're wondering why it's considered experimental, we could be billing for this, but we know that insurances don't usually cover new procedures, as many of you probably learned from genetic testing. So as such, we've been able to hopefully, um, and hopefully into the future, cover the cost of this. We work with companies from around the United States, and we work with a company in, or with a, um, an institution in Germany um, and, and with uh, Dr. Cuneo in Colorado, and, and hopefully soon we'll be expanding those numbers of um, institutions that we work with. But by working with these companies, we've been able to um, advance the science that goes along with it. So in a second, I'm gonna introduce Gretchen, but let me just tell you a little bit about MCG. Um, we've studied over the last 20 years, almost a thousand patients. Um, it, it is not MRI. A lot of people think because the word magnet is in the title um, that it's, it produces magnetism, but this is actually just a passive sensor to actually emit any energy at all. Um, so it's um, safe in that sense. Um, we usually are able to give interpretations like the picture on the right upper side um, that happens to be a baby with two to one heart block where there's two atrial beats for every ventricular beat. And in that setting, we're able to give those results right away to the patient um, at the end of the session. Um, the AHA has looked at this and said um, in a scientific statement that the benefits outweigh the risks. But unfortunately, it's been trapped for 20 years in the base in the in a uh, physics lab because of the cost. It, the setup is over a million dollars, and most hospitals just aren't willing to invest that amount of money. So, in more recent times, with this new quantum sensor technologies, we've been able to bring forward optically pumped magnetometry, and OPMs just sense very tiny um, uh, cardiac signals. Uh, using sensors that um, that um, use optics, and so they're much cheaper than the helium and the other things that that cost money. Um, I noticed that I just forgot to introduce Gretchen. So before I go on to OPMs, I'd like to have Gretchen comment a little bit about her role in setting patients up and and how she. Um, and how she um, helps us as the study coordinator. I also wanted to put a plug in because most nurses are not also writing papers, but Gretchen and um, her colleague, Mary Butler, just submitted a paper that will be beneficial to nurses um, who take care of high-risk patients like this. Um, to, and she submitted it to the Journal of Obstetrics and Neonatal Nursing. So hopefully that'll be coming out in the next year or so. Gretchen, you wanna say something? Yeah, can, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, good afternoon and thank you, Dr. Strasberger, and thank you, SADS, for allowing me just to briefly introduce myself. But as Dr. Strasberger mentioned, I work directly with her on her uh, research project involving the fetal magnetocardiography. So I am available and love to work with families and educate them about our research study, about what participation may involve. Um, I do a lot of the coordinating of the visits, uh, working with Dr. Ron Mackay in the uh, physics lab in Madison. I um, help Dr. Strasberger with relaying results back to providers. I help with um, any coordination, any questions, anything. Um, love to work with the families, love to make sure you understand what uh, this may involve. So I am available. I can be reached by either email or direct phone number, and I can work with Marsha. I was thinking I could put it in the chat, but I don't see a chat option to put that, so I'll have to work on that, uh, getting uh, my email and direct phone number available to answer any questions about our research project, so thank you again. What Gretchen didn't say is that she has a long time history of being an obstetrical nurse in labor and delivery. So she has a lot of experience both in cardiology research and obstetrics, which is really helpful to us since I have no obstetrical background. I'm a pediatric cardiologist. So this big device here that, that sits on the ceiling um, is like a thermos bottle and it contains helium. And that's the reason it's so costly to do um, the, the squid type um, the, the squid type procedures, but this OPM technology that's coming along actually puts everything that's in that huge device into these little tiny sensors. And um, this shows a patient before she slides into this cylinder tube. The tube has three layers of 
insulation that prevent um, outside electrical noise from contaminating the signal. So we can, we can harness these really tiny signals that are coming from the baby's heart. And we also get mom's signal, and that's part of the challenge is separating those two. Um, a company in California just got a $1.5 million um, grant in order to improve this technology for the shielding. And um, with this new superconducting shielding, they think it'll be 10 times better than what we are currently using. So that should allow us to you know, make earlier and earlier diagnoses as well as to make better and more accurate diagnoses. Um, so this is just a cardiac monitor in an ICU. And a lot of people don't realize that the kind of monitoring that you get with the belt around the waist in obstetrics is totally different than this. In fact, usually the only things that ultrasound or echo give us um, and the belt around the waist is the heart rate, whether or not there's an arrhythmia and whether there's abnormalities in the heart uh, thickness or anatomy. But it's really all these other things, the QT interval specifically, that is that determine whether a baby makes it to survive. And so we think that what we're providing with the MCG will be a huge advancement in um, medicine once it's able to be there in every fetal care center. So there's a huge number of things that influence a pregnancy. First of all, the baby grows a lot, and there's a lot of things like the fact that the oxygen levels are lower. Um, mom's nutrition is important, exposure to meds, um, and even buoyancy. You know, we know that about a third of the cardiac arrests that occur in, in children with long QT occur in water. Um, but the only time in your life that you're floating around is actually if you're in outer space or if you're in utero. And so we think that what's happening is that some of the QT interval short, uh, lengthening is actually the effects of this buoyancy. So in most cases, especially LQT2 and 3 and the variants that are rare, we actually see the QT interval shortening after a baby's born. And so, um, so we try to get the babies to that point. So in the journey of pregnancy, we, there's really different stages. The first stage is your pre-pregnancy, your general health, and should you be taking the, the risk yourself? And if you have long QT and, and, you know, just making that decision about having a family. And that's something I think Susie will touch on. The genetic counseling is really important. It's at this time that you can determine whether the testing that you had done is adequate. Um, you know, maybe there's something that's changed. Maybe it's a VUS now instead of a, an actual uh, problem. And in which case, maybe you don't need to be on a medication. But in fact, most patients are on medications and need to stay on their medications. And it's best not to change those medications in early pregnancy. It's best not to stop them for sure, but they're usually pretty safe. The beta blockers are used you know, extensively for treatment of um, maternal conditions like high blood pressure and preeclampsia. So don't worry about your beta blocker. Um, it's best for you. And, um, but the babies that are born to moms with long QT are a little smaller. I know Susan touched on this, but they weigh about six pounds, three ounces at term, as opposed to if the baby's dad has long QT, they might weigh on average seven pounds, 11 ounces. So this isn't much different between whether the mom's on a beta blocker or not. It doesn't seem to be specific to the beta blocker. So don't worry if you're on a beta blocker. Some beta blockers, like mentioned earlier, natalol does have a little more effect on growth, but we're talking about minimal effects. Um, and, and obviously you need a care team that knows what they're doing, but if you're under that care, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, I, it's a good time to have your ICD checked in early pregnancy. During mid-pregnancy, that's when we do the MCGs if you choose to have it done. It's also a time when your body's changing a lot and, and your body has natural minerals that prevent arrhythmias. Uh, things like, I'm sorry, I just hit the button. Um, things like magnesium and calcium and, and vitamin D's role is actually to improve the absorption of calcium and magnesium. So if you're low on those things that can be um, pro-rhythmic both for yourself if you have long QT and also for the baby if the baby has long QT. Late in pregnancy, things like medication um, increases may need to take place because your body expands by 40% with pregnancy. And a lot of that is the intravascular uh, volume of fluids. And, and so you may need adjustments in your medication upward. Um, not everybody does. Um, 
you have to decide obviously at that point where you're going to deliver and the timing of the delivery and are they going to induce you or are they going to let you go into labor so um, those are all decisions late in pregnancy to make with your provider and then finally there's the postpartum period and what we call the fourth trimester which is the time in between pregnancies and those are also very important the decisions on breastfeeding we we touched on those um I know there were a couple questions in the chat about both sotalol and uh, which beta blockers. Um, there is a difference in beta blockers in terms of how much gets into breast milk. Propranolol probably has the least effect on breast milk, but remember propranolol is a short acting drug. So if you take that drug, you should be on the long acting form of it, not the short acting form. Um, it's probably better not to change uh, medications again at this point in time. Um, but it's up to you and your physician. There are some beta blockers that, uh, like natalol that have a little more um, passage into the breast milk. Sotalol is also one that has some transfer into the breast milk, but these are both relatively safe. And we have patients who routinely take um, sotalol, flecainide, or a beta blocker during breastfeeding. And, and in general, the first few days when you're starting breastfeeding, the, the baby can be monitored for side effects like low blood sugar or um, low heart rate. Those, those are not often seen. And when they are, they're usually pretty, um, pretty easily managed. So um, I would not worry about breastfeeding. One thing I would tell you though, is that postpartum depression affects 10% of all pregnancies. And it is a time when um, you, with postpartum depression, it can affect your, your short-term memory. And when it does, it can affect your ability to remember if you gave your medication to yourself or your baby. So keep a calendar, re remember that postpartum depression itself should be treated. It's dangerous. It can affect how you give medications to yourself and your baby. And finally, the medicines that were increased during pregnancy often need to be decreased during this time. So this is just a timeline for MCG. We can sometimes do it as early as 15 weeks, but the problem is before 27 weeks, if we're not looking for an arrhythmia specifically, we sometimes can miss a negative test. So if the test is negative, we may want you to come back after 27 weeks, but if it's positive, we're usually pretty confident that that's real. Now, um, over 27 weeks, we're almost 100% accurate in terms of um, you know, being able to tell if a baby does or does not have long QT syndrome. Um, and sometimes late in pregnancy, we'll have you come back if the baby has quite a long QT, just because we do sometimes see arrhythmias develop at around 34 weeks and beyond. And it helps sometimes in determining the timing of delivery as well. So generally most patients come once, but uh, you might have to come twice in some settings. So um, just another comment, and that is that when you go in for your OB checks in early pregnancy, it's not good enough for them to just check off a check mark on the electronic medical record that says the baby has a heart rate, heartbeat. They should be checking the heart rate at every checkup, and they should be checking that heart rate against what's normal. Because in this case, normal is this middle line here. The lower line is the, um, is the lower normal. These are all long QT patients with the diamonds, and these are the ones that the obstetricians would pick up, anybody below 110. So most obstetricians are actually missing most cases of long QT syndrome that could be picked up if they were actually looking at what the heart rate should be, not at a rate of 110. So they're not careful enough to identify that there is this group of patients that are at risk for long QT, even if they don't know they're at risk. If fetal bradycardia can be long QT. So I'm not gonna go into too much details here. The types of, um, most patients have the familial type of long QT. And in that setting, we have had um, no cases of mortality. We've been able to actively manage every case successfully. And so in that setting, we look for certain things. Some of the tip-offs like this um, fetus here are a fast heartbeat, a slow heartbeat. Now you'll notice the rate will be normal for a second, like here, and then it'll be slow. See how it slows down? When we see that combination of a fast heartbeat and a slow heartbeat, that's often a tip-off that it's long QT syndrome. 
And uh, we do have effective treatments for this, some of which include beta blockers. So sometimes it, it's as easy as increasing the mom's beta blocker dose or switching her to a one that's better absorbed and transferred to the baby. For example, propranolol gets across the placenta better than natalol does. So in certain high-risk situations, we would consider transitioning you, but it would be only if it were for the benefit of the baby. So um, stillbirths, this, this came out in 2019, and I mentioned it just because I, I, don't, I, I think that it could scare some patients with, uh, with familial long QT because it showed that there is a higher incidence of stillbirth, um, eight times higher than the general population, and with miscarriages twice as high. But these were pregnancies, this was a retrospective pregnant, uh, uh, study, and these pregnancies were not at all proactively managed. And so as a result, we, you know, they didn't have the advantages of proactive management. So what is proactive management? Staying on your medication if it's prescribed, carefully choosing your care team, regular monitoring in obstetrics, delivering where and when is appropriate. The FMCG, if you can come and have that done, correcting your nutrition, avoiding QT, dr QT drugs, um, are used commonly pregnancy as mentioned on, on Dancitron is one of them. Pitocin, you can't always avoid them. Pitocin is used routinely to augment labor and you can't always um, eliminate that risk. But at least if you're in a care center where they know how to monitor you, you will be cared for appropriately. And finally, of course, the healthy lifestyle. So I wanted to mention too, that when the baby's heart rate slows down as it does here on this tracing, this baby happens to have something called a two to one block. It's, it's commonly seen with certain types of long QT. In this case, as it slows down even further to three to one block, what you see is that the QT interval actually gets longer. So we do our best um, to try to keep these heart rates as high as we can during the pregnancy. This is just an example of a fast heartbeat, what we call torsad. And a lot of times babies have a lot of torsad and that's, that's something that we try to treat, but we don't always get to 100% effectiveness of the treatment because um, you know, sometimes the, the drug dosing needed to get to 100% effectiveness is just too high, or we may not have the right drugs. Um, but in general, in utero treatment is safer than delivering the baby and treating a premature baby because the premature baby not, does not have you know, the, the, the liver enzymes to metabolize these drugs very well. So if at all possible, we keep the baby inside in order to treat. And we do have effective treatments. And sometimes, like I said, we don't even have to have 100% control because the placenta itself provides a blood pressure for the baby. Whereas if the baby were born, um, you know, that's not true. So at least the placenta is actually a helpful supporting mechanism, kind of like the heart lung machine would be. Um, so I'm not going to go into this except to say that torsad by fetal echo is missed all the time, about 80% of the time it's missed. And the reason it is, is because the valves don't open. So this is just the aortic valve opening here. But when these valves, when, when the heart rate is really fast, the valves don't open. So it actually looks almost like a normal rate. And so as a result, these can be missed. And most of the ones that are missed are the ones where the baby's the first person in the family affected when the fetus is, is the, what's called the proband or the first affected. And so, um, like I mentioned, we've had no mortality when we recognize these and when we treat it. And this is just an example of what so, some of the things we look at with this, the heart rate here in this fetus is about 60. It's slow and it's in a two to one block, but but um, when the fetus is moving, we do see more of the torsad. Um, so in conclusion, I'd like to um, just say that FMCG is an emerging technology that's capable of providing ECG-like heart rhythm and conduction monitoring. Um, and over 95% of the time, we can tell the, uh, we're, it's sensitive and specific for identifying whether or not long QT syndrome is present in the fetus after 27 weeks. It's a little less sensitive before that time, but we can always have you come back. Um, and then participating in the long QT studies like ours will improve our ability to recognize and if needed to treat fetuses with arrhythmias. And sometimes we find arrhythmias we weren't really suspecting. So I'm gonna turn it over at this point to Susie and have her talk about her journey through pregnancy because she did come and 
participate. And, and I think her story is one that is really um, inspiring for everybody. She's a great mother and a great person. So Susie, do you want to take over? Thanks, Dr. Strasberger. I appreciate that. I have to figure out how to stop sharing here. OK, there you go. <laughs> well, um, first of all, let me say that Gretchen and Dr. Strasberger are incredibly reassuring and know so much. And I learned so much about my pregnancy from them, um, in addition to my regular care teams that I had here in Michigan. Um, so I am, I have inherited, or I have long QT. I was de novo in my family. And so um, the technology that exists from when I was born 36 years ago to today is, um, it's a staggering improvement. It's an incredible how much, how much more we know. Um, but that being said, I feel like um, pregnancy technology is still a little, it, you would expect more. <laughs> <laughs> You'd expect more at this point. And so Dr. Strasberger's study, um, when I talked to them, when I was first thinking about signing up and enrolling, was incredible. The information that they can provide um, on this baby is, is just amazing what you can see. Um, and so anyway, we had our 20-week ultrasound with Gabby, our daughter Gabby, and everything looked fine as far as we could tell, um, but they couldn't get great images of the heart. And so they um, asked us to come back at 24 weeks, I believe it was. And so at 24 weeks, we had another anatomical scan and we got the images of the heart and it looked like she was in two to one heart block and um, she had a very low heart rate. And I remember the ultrasound tech at our local clinic very, very quietly putting down the wand and saying, excuse me for a minute <laughs> and leaving the room because what she saw was, was very concerning. Um, luckily we had uh, a care team here in Kalamazoo that didn't immediately rush us to delivery. And I'm forever grateful for that, that they allowed Gabby to go full term with very close monitoring. Um, so anyway, at that point we were like, well, we're definitely going to Wisconsin to get this, this test done and to learn a little bit more information. And so we live in Michigan. And so it wasn't too, too tough of a, a drive for us. I can't remember how long it was, but it was like, my husband had been working the day before. So they had this next day off. And so we were able to kind of do a day trip and stay the night over there. Um, and <laughs> Dr. Strasberger, I was actually just talking to Brad about it. And I was like, gosh, do we remember the details of this trip at this point? We're like, it's starting to be so much has happened between then and now. But um, the machine itself is pretty impressive. You go into a room and it's like a metal lined room. And I was so grateful for that intercom that was in that room because it made me feel like I wasn't totally alone <laughs> that whole time because it's it feels like a real sensory uh, deprivation tank kind of thing. And you go in there, you're lying on a bed and it looks like this giant telescope is aimed at your belly. And you just, your job is just to lay still and relax, which uh, is a little harder than it sounds sometimes. And, um, but they got the imaging they needed. And just like Dr. Strasberger said, we had results instantly. And we had a, a conversation at the end of that long day. And because they just wanted to get, they, they took as many images as they needed, as many, um, what did you call them? I can't remember. Runs, but, runs. Yeah, you got as many runs as you needed to um, kind of verify what you were seeing. And they saw that Gabby was, was doing a lot of classic long QT and heart block and a lot of stuff, but in a pretty intense way. Um, and in a way that I hadn't been necessarily expecting it to be that severe in presentation. And so with, you know, we, we went home and digested that and um, made plans to talk about it and potentially come back for a second test later on in like the 30, the 30 weeks time period. Um, and so with that information though, that we were able to gather through the test, Dr. Strasberger, and Gretchen worked with our local care team and 
they were able to come up with a plan for what we should do for labor and delivery and what I should do to optimize the health, you know, learning about this, the vitamin and mineral nutrition, that was, that was not something I had in conversation with my regular maternal care. And so that was really, really helpful. Um, and I just kind of felt like I had a, a direct link to a, a private advisor <laughs> and, and they were so generous with their time and their knowledge. Um, we were able to coordinate kind of a complicated uh, drug drug test, I guess, of, of trying out a different type of, wasn't a beta blocker, a different type of cardiac drug for me to see if that would improve Gabby's status in utero. And that involved a hospital admission in, a, in Ann Arbor and coordinating with the OBGYN, te, OBGYN team there and potentially her future cardiology team who, who were like half my cardiology team and, and my current cardiologist. It was, I, I heard about the email chain that involved us. There were like 15 people on it, you know, most of whom were MDs. And so it's just very impressive how generous everyone was with, with their knowledge and time. And um, I truly think that Gabby's outcomes would not have been as good as they were if we had not had this research study, if we had not had that knowledge, if we had not been able to prepare so well, you know, we were able to make a plan for her delivery. And when all those plans got thrown out the water, out the window, because she, <laughs> we had set our date for our uh, C-section and a week later on one of my twice a week ultrasounds that I had with MFM, they, uh, they said, she's, uh, she's looking a little tough. <laughs> you guys need to go to Ann Arbor. So a week earlier than everything was planned and set, everything got set in motion. So in the end, it worked out. It was a very exciting and dramatic time, um, but I'm, I'm just grateful for everything they did for us. Can you tell us a little bit, Susie, about, um, about the postnatal care of your baby? Um, like how she has done or like what, what yeah. we did at delivery? Yeah, what happened, you know, in the, in the newborn nursery after delivery, like, you know, what, what kinds of things did they start as medicines or, or mm. treat her with? Um, yes. Yes. That's a good question because with the information we had from that test that kind of led us in the planning process for what would happen when she was delivered. And so they had at U of M, they have this thing called the NEST, and it's it's an acronym. And again, I learned so much during that time, and I have forgotten so much in that time. And so it, they basically have a whole team of intensivists waiting for that new baby to come, and they run every test on that baby possible. And um, they hook her up. They hooked her up immediately to some external defibrillator pads and heart monitoring and IVs, and they got her ready and. Uh, pretty soon thereafter, after they saw how she looked, um, she didn't need oxygen or no, she did need a little supplemental oxygen when she was born, but luckily she like looked so good, all things considered that that was all she needed was a little supplemental oxygen. Um, they took her and gave her a temporary pacemaker and started her on a beta blocker. Um, it, it's not the beta blocker that she continues to take, but so they, they switched her to natal law soon thereafter. And uh, about five or six days later, she got a permanent pacemaker. Um, she had to stay in the cardiac ICU, the pediatric cardiothoracic ICU for about a week. Um, she did really well with her surgery. She was on a nasal cannula that night after her surgery. You know, she didn't have to have any other supportive care, which was amazing. And um, then for another week, we were in the hospital. At the time, it felt like an eternity. <laughs> it was during it was during COVID, so you know we didn't have our normal resources available, you know, personal resources or even hospital resources available that you normally would. And so that was very challenging on its own in its own right. Um, but uh, yeah, we went home with our pediatric AED and. Um, we had a at-home nursing visit for a while just to monitor her because she made everyone really nervous for a while, but she's doing really well now. That's great. <laughs> so we have a couple questions from our Hoover platform I'd like to share with you. Uh, 
Uh, one is, do you have any special recommendations for CPVT and pregnancy? We just don't have enough experience. Um, we do know that patients who have PVCs, PVCs are thought to be a somewhat common arrhythmia in, um, in pregnancy. They're not as common as, um, a PVC is like an early beat from the ventricle. Um, the most common is an early beat from the atrium, and that's actually seen in like 1% of all pregnancies, but PVCs were once thought to be innocent. What we're finding is that there is a small percentage of po the population of fetuses with PVCs that have CPVT. Um, at this time, there, the one that we have that was tested positive actually had a, a variant of unknown significance. So Again, we don't know that that was the cause of the, of the PVCs, but in that particular case, an uncle had had a cardiac arrest. And so, you know, probably. So I think that what I can say is that um, we can certainly talk to families if they have uh, questions about whether the procedure would be of any value. Um, but we just don't know yet because we haven't studied that many patients. And, and again, there aren't as many examples of ECGs in CPVT in the newborn that would tell us that this is definitely going to be used. Okay, thank you. Second question, can you speak to managing Brugada? during pregnancy and what about continuing quinidine? Um, I would probably, we have used quinidine for other reasons in pregnancy in the past. There's better drugs that have been used uh, for, we used it in the past for SVT. And so it has been used in pregnancy and it is relatively safe. Um, and so if you are on it, I would say that um, it might be useful to get a, an MCG um, during that pregnancy because we could look at the QT interval. We know that quinidine is one of the drugs that can lengthen QT interval. Um, that's why it's beneficial in certain of the, of the arrhythmia, inherited arrhythmia syndromes. So I would say that if you're on it, stay on it and, um, and, and consider an FMCG if you are pregnant. This is another question. It's not necessarily a pregnancy question, but let's see, Dr. Strasberger, if you can do any, any com comment on this. Who is doing research related to hormonal fluctuations and life-threatening arrhythmias? My EP team has communicated that they just don't have experience or awareness around this as a trigger, yet my events seem to be highly co correlated with menstruation in particular. You know, there are a couple of um, female adult electrophysiologists. Dana is one, she's spoken. Maybe you could uh, give them a little bit of Dana's background. She is one. Um, I also am on a writing group for a scientific statement that's being put out by the Heart Rhythm Society on arrhythmias in pregnancy. So that's arrhythmias both in the mom and the baby. And that's supposed to be out sometime this year. And the women that are, are, I shouldn't just say the women because there's men on this group too, but the people on that writing group tend to be the experts on the clinical management. Um, and so once that's out, I would look at that list and see. Um, I don't know specific names other than Dana, but maybe you could mm -hmm. just maybe refer Marsha to, to her work. Yes, we can do that. Okay, let's see. I believe that completes the questions here. Uh, do you have any other closing comments, Jeanette or Gretchen or Susie? Thank you for wonderful presentations. I enjoyed hearing hearing them. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you to all who have participated. I see some names and some common familiar faces in the group of SADS attendees. And we we value very much the participation. About one in nine of all of the cases that come to see us in in our programs are, are long QT or inherited arrhythmia syndrome patients. And so um, we have learned so much over the last 20 years and I'm sure in 20 years into the future, it will be a totally different picture from what Susie experienced. And I'm sure Susie, as I look at this, imagine what your mother experienced when you were young. So. <laughs> yes, we had it a lot easier in that way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I don't have any additional comments, but thank you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Appreciate your yes. participation and presenting today. And um, I want I think we'll close out here, do our wrap up with the conference, the virtual conference.